this uh, particular program is in four parts, and this is the first of our Lapidus Lecture Series. Um, tonight is on style and legacy, but on October 7th, we have Lincoln Road, and on October 28th, we have Style and Quest, and then on November 18th, we have Legacy and MIMO. So we have a whole uh, a great lineup for you all this season. And in addition, we have a whole separate series called The Art of Architecture. And that one, the first one is this coming Monday with Todd Tragash, and that's here at the museum. And then we'll have on October 18th um, an event at the community church. And then we'll have on November 15th an event at the Marseille Hotel and finally, December 13th at the Betsy Hotel. And Nancy Liebman is here. She was a coordinator of the Art of Architecture, so we'll give her a round of applause. Thank you, Nancy. And um, so I guess we'll jump right into it. We're very honored to have Deborah Desolitz, who is the curator of this program and is an amazing um, person who I got to meet through developing this exhibit. But her time in Miami Beach goes way far back. And she is an architect and an artist. And she was actually Morris Lapidus's last collaborator. And Morris actually worked in her office, her architectural office on Lincoln Road. She met Lapidus in 1993 when she was marketing director for the Miami-based architectural firm Architectonica after founding their computer lab in 1988. Soon after, Deborah left to create her own firm where subsequently she was able to work with Lapidus on a number of design projects which explored each of his illustrious career's building types. Desolitz has lectured extensively nationally and internationally on Lapidus's body of work and is the author of Morris Lapidus, The Architecture of Joy, published by Rizzoli in 2012. And she has graciously gifted the archive left to her by Morris Lapidus to Syracuse University, the repository of his work since the 1960s, and she is also the owner of the Morris Lapidus trademark and continues production under that mark. So without further ado, let's welcome Deborah. Thank you. To be in a room talking about Lapidus, it's my thrill, it's my joy, and thank you all for being here. Um, I have slides that I've prepared, and I wanted to um, first acknowledge all of the, um, thank you very, Thank you. I wanted to first acknowledge all of the people that I've been speaking to with for the last three months that are really making this come to life in terms of discussions about his legacy. Um, Arlene Pavone will t tackle the history of Lapidus and Alex Quinlan will pace him in the culture. Reed Kroloff wanted to come if he could speak about style and be um, stylist um, extraordinaire with Aaron Betsky. So these are deans of um, two prevalent universities in uh, America. And then we have Avrajan and uh, Hira Hatta and Diane Ball speaking about Lincoln Road and Alan Schulman locally, Jean-Francois Lejeune and Ira Giller speaking last. Uh, all of them are taken as a sound bites uh, about style or about legacy or about a quest for emotion and motion and architecture being the driving force of this um, series. And so I hope all of you get to come and enjoy those discussions. Am I clicking the right one to move forward? Let's see. Okay, which, okay, left or right. My focus in explaining um, or introducing the topic is who is Morris Lapidus? And I don't know if everybody really has read all five of his books or if everybody sat with him with so many conversations as I have. So I'm hoping I give you some inside stories about his life. And then I hope if you want to ask more that you'll continue that conversation with MDPL and ask online and we'll try to answer them. Um, 
he was a complicated man, but he was very spatial. <laughs> and so um, I think um, you'll enjoy that aspect of him. Senator uh, Claude Denson Pepper in 1971 really helped give Morris a shot in the arm when he said that Morris Lapidus has created a uniquely American architecture. Though he was once criticized, Morris Lapidus is now being written about, and there are exhibitions on his work, and he is electrifying architectural students, one-third his age, in lectures at campuses all over the nation. A creative person cannot aspire to any higher aim. He delivered that before the House of Representatives, May 16, 1971, and he called it a tribute to the genius of Morris Lapidus. He had said at that time that Morris Lapidus did more for Florida's architecture than any sole architect. In 2012, the AIA in Florida had a vote for which buildings in Florida were the most iconic. The Fountain Blue still continues to be the most iconic building in the state of Florida. It's recognized all over the world. For that, we can thank Mr. Lapidus. His family was born in, in Riga, and he is from, he is a Russian Jew. The family had been for generations with the Hasidic League. They had worked with merchants, they had sold materials, they had sold products. And um, the stories from Richard Lapidus are exhausting and exciting at the same time. Let it suffice that for 500 years they traveled the Baltic area, settled in Riga, and then moved to Odessa. In Odessa they were under the Tsar, of course, and uh, Leon Lapidus, who I'm showing here at the bottom, was Morris's father and would be a coppersmith with the Tsar and quite possibly would have ended his life as the last copper, as the last sergeant, uh, Jewish quite possibly the only Jewish sergeant in the Tsar's army at that time. But that was all the beauty, all the onion domes could not keep them because they were Jewish and all the programs were not something that the mother wanted to live through. His oldest son, Moise, was born in Odessa at the, and at the urging of his wife who feared another program had Leon and the family left and they went via steamship in the steward cabins underneath. Um, at the same time, unbeknownst to Mr. Lapidus, and probably unbeknownst to the Sirkin family, uh, Pop Sirkin would also leave Russia. These two men would figure in relationships, intertwined relationships on the shores of Miami Beach for the next 50, until the 60s. And I think it's interesting that they both left Russia at the exact same time. It was like Haley's Comet, things were speeding up. They hit the Lower East Side and the child grew up and there were more family members. Leon Lapidus would wind up making canisters for headlights. We all know that Carl Graham Fisher made his money with Prestolite making canisters for Ford's cars. Quite possibly US Metals, which became the company of Leon Lapidus, was making the very canisters that Prestolite was being put in. So being that he has, um, now we've spun a web. We have Fisher, we have Sirkin, we have Lapidus. We have families that have come for different reasons and they'll find a journey together on Miami Beach. Lapidus would say that an event in a young child's life can so indelibly put a mark on them that they um, are blown away by it, basically. It was a happening. When he saw the electric lights go on at Coney Island, for him it was the beginning of um, a magical world of forms and swooping colors, and he wanted to be a part of that. It made him later say, people are attracted to light, and that would be the first, one of his first theories for his architecture. One man hand always finishes the other. This Escher painting is to give me a break so that I can tell you Lapidus would say to me, don't forget Carl Graham Fisher. He built Miami Beach. Without him, I would have had no playground. I would have had no laboratory for design. We start with Carl Fisher in 1909 with his wife. Haley's Comet's approaching, and in some circles, it's heralding the age of speed. He marries, and he comes to... Um, New Orleans, and his boat is lost in a hurricane. <laughs> they are um, windswept, I mean, windswept up on a little beach in Mobile, Alabama. 
while the boat is being sailed to Miami, they go home to Indianapolis, and John Levy, who we know in our circles here, John Levy would be the engineer of the boat at that time, and he would sail it to Miami. He would write a little note to Carl, arrive safely, Miami, pretty little town, why not meet me here instead of Jacksonville? In 1910, this is what Miami looked like when Carl Fisher saw it. It was a fishing town, and there were some cars on the street, not, but most bicycles. Carl Fisher would see an unfinished bridge. We all know that story. He would start work with, Carl, with John Collins. They would form friendships and relationships that would build Miami Beach at the very beginning. Lincoln Road, Lincoln Highway would be developed by Carl Graham Fisher at the exact same time. He would also be developing streets on Miami Beach for the first time. He was dredging, making the dredge the symbol of Florida. And this is what Miami Beach would look like at the time that he was dredging it and making it. He was pumping water out of the bay, I mean the dredging the bottom of the bay onto the um, mangrove roots and turning that into a foundation for the beach. He would put a monument up to Flagler and by the time it was done you'd have all the floating islands off of Miami that we see today. But in 1914, that's what the rest of Florida looked like. You have these beautiful roads and beautiful beaches, but it's very desolate in the middle. Carl Fisher would bring the Dixie Highway. The Dixie Highway would make 5,675 miles from Montauk, Michigan, all the way down to Miami Beach. It would end at the very bridge that Carl built with Collins. It's the beginning, really, of the roads in Florida. And the old Dixie Highway that we have left is part of that system. This is the celebration in 1915 of the opening of the bridge and the first car that's going across to come to Miami Beach. Miami Beach is one of the first cities in the world, really, that was planned just for cars. The only one I, other one I know of was Speedway in um, Indianapolis because Carl Fisher planned that too. And he, plan <laughs> and he planned it for his Indianapolis um, mechanics. And they always had a garage. And it was all for cars, not carriages. Of course, this is the jazz age. And the roads were laid just in time to bring everybody to Florida. The uh, 1903 to 1908, the economy was in recession. From 1912, the recession ended, and it supplied equipment to Europe for World War I, right? And during this time, the economy was expanding, and the Dow was up over 100%. The economy continued to expand during World War II into the years 1945, with the Dow up another 125% in 1953. If we think of the glory years, we have to think of it in terms of this economy. This was a boom and bust economy. So I wanted to set that, you know, Lapidus built, but he, he was a man of his time, and he was also a man of, the, of you know, the, the making of the world around him. Jane Fisher we owe a lot to. I think we all know that. She was our first bathing beauty. Beauty in the beach, it's because beauty made the beach. Without this card, without this invitation to come to Miami, without Sodom and Gomorrah, without Jane cutting her, cutting her bathing suit, taking off her hosiery, flipping off her shoes, and saying, you know, come, you know, to Miami Beach. It was Jane's beauty and all the bathing beauties after her and nothing more that sold Miami Beach and still does. The pursuit of happiness in America at that time, it really, and I quote David Hickey from The Invisible Dragon, it disdains the helmet laws. We disdain being restrained. And Jane really knew that, right? She's like, and every, every pulpit throughout America was saying, it's Sodom and Gomorrah in Miami, and everybody had to come. Um, it acknowledges that our passionate, um, you know, expectation of feeling simultaneously at home in our bodies, in the world, and in society, that we're calmed and socialized by seeing other people the same thing that we're doing. And Jane was the first one to start us in this. So uh, Jane deserves a whole, <laughs> a whole plaque herself. I, I, and so I wanted to analyze this for just a second longer because Miami Beach was, as you saw, a pancake just dredged, dredged 
um, sludge from the bottom of the um, Biscayne Bay, and then it had Everglade muck on top of it. So it was a man-made island, right? And there were no blades of grass, there was no tree, there was no flower. And interestingly, Carl Graham Fisher would hire Japanese gardeners to plant all of the, um, all the trees and the flowers that we see. And if you look at Jane, she's using, she has a, um, a Japanese um, parasol, and she also has a silk bandana, and she's also um, quite exotic, correct? So in the terms of beauty, I think the photograph of Jane sold the beach, not just in her person, but also in the exoticism that it looked at and that it points to in that picture. Um, she also brought gondolas and she, and you know, and brought it in the Venetian flair. So Jane offered us a lot of things on the beach that if it's fantastical, it's only fantastical because it was started that way. Here's Carl fishing. I mean, he turned Bull Isle, Bell Isle into his motor speedway. It was his speedway on water. He's, he broke more speed records on Biscayne Bay that are still not broken. And he also brought planes. And this is the Whitman Way, <clears throat> which we now know as Espanola Way. And the Whitmans were not small in this play of words and parties and people. Leona would be the one that would sell, or Ilona would, would sell the San, her estate to build the San Susi. This is what it looked like back in 1915. We have some tall buildings by Carl. He built over five hotels. And we have the Roman um, bath, the Nautilus. That's the surf bar. That's at Fifth. And we have Harding came. And we had all the theater people came. And if you notice the onion domes behind them, we're now getting back to our roots, right? They have the onion domes and all the exotic wares and the bathing beauties. Then came the hurricane. So that really sets the stage for the next part of the story. After the hurricane and they were rebuilding, more people would come and make a new story for Miami Beach. Meanwhile, Lapidus is in New York studying to be a scenic designer. He's studying, to, he's painting now at the University of Columbia. He's acting. He thinks he's gonna be an actor. And he says, no, I'm finally gonna be an architect. He comes with his wife, and he marries his wife in 1929. He comes to the Woford Hotel. That's the first time that he stepped foot on Miami Beach. He said that they had just come from Cuba, and Bee's girdle had Bacardi rum in it. And when she stepped out of the taxi, the rum spilled on the floor, or on the concrete, and, and broke open. So he was awash in rum as he stepped his foot on Miami Beach. Um, he came from Brooklyn to the beaches, and he had money because his father had U.S. medals, and he had decided to do store design, not architecture, for um, hotels at that time. Pop Serkin came, and at the same time, he was building while Lapidus was in New York enjoying the jazz age and learning all, and getting all that shook up stuff about the jazz era. Pop Serkin was down here working with Polovitsky doing the Atlantis Hotel. And the reason it's important to say this is that Daniel had asked me, at what point did the Mediterranean style kind of give way to something else? And I really do think the turning point, the tipping point, is the Atlantis with Igor Polovitsky. Because at that time, the Mediterranean style was still being done, but, but Igor Polovitsky became the architect for the Serkin family and would work with them for 17 years doing this modern style that looked like steamships. And um, that became a prevalent look. But Lapidus saw the theater in his American stores. He was understanding America's commerce in desirable objects, just as F. Scott Fitzgerald did. And with a landscape of Gatsby dreaming, he liked it. And he proceeded to refine the interiors of his stores with a landscape that would invest it with style. Lapidus was the father of the jazz era store. And these, I'm gonna now show you some of the stores that he was doing in New York while Miami Beach was interested in its steam, um, in its um, modern style, Lapidus was experimenting with interiors. He broke all the rules 
basically. He illuminated things. He had frosted ceilings, niches with indirect light. Color was introduced. He had signage. He was exploring what, would be, what he would later call in life his theories of architecture for store design. Lapidus was changing the face of America with his architecture. The heart of America was changing. It was a new Euro European class structure was being invented for serious architects. And the fountain blow later would simply be, and all of his stores would just be a foil for him to put ornament on. He had the double day store, Teresa Pharmacy, the Parisian Brutery. Um, all of these stores would go all over America. Morris said that he went to almost every city in America doing a store on Main Street. So he really was, um, just like what phonographs do with music, music, I mean, that you, it spreads the music, Morris was spreading his um, philosophy of store design through every store that he was doing. At the end of it, he would do 500 stores across America. So the very main street that Disney liked was actually the main street Morris was developing. Lapidus was, at, was one of the great American dreamers. Remember, he was that first generation of American born with the 20th century who shaped the very tone and texture of our lives as he was building his own. He said, I devised a theory of design comprised of seven elements that dominate my approach to all my work. Now don't think he said this in 1929. Don't think he said this in 1921 or any of that. He said this in 1999 when I said, Lapidus, when are you going to share with us what you did? If not now, when? And if not for who? Whom? If not for you, do this, tell us. And he finally sat down and wrote a little page that said, these are my theories. And then instead of defending his work, he started celebrating what he had done in architecture. And these I'd like to present to you now as his seven theories. Graphics. The first element I found was in a study of graphics and identification, absolutely necessary but by and large left out of typical architectural discourse. Lighting. My second discovery I call the moth complex. People are attracted to light and the placement and use of light has played an important role in all my work. Color. I found that color created unusual stores. Color not only attracts but pleases people and people are the ultimate clients for whom I design. Treatment of structural columns. In many of the stores I designed, I was confronted with immovable structural columns and the question of what to do with them to make them attractive. Morris would say that all the weight of the stores were on the stores. There were tall buildings above them. The only way to make a column look light was to lose them in a ring of light. And then you would not feel the heaviness of the building on top of them. All of a sudden, the store just seemed to float. Undulating planes and sweeping curves. Throughout time, buildings have been built as boxes. However, there have been some exceptions. And he said, I personally dislike boxes. I preferred flowing, sweeping, unusually designed buildings. Morris said at the end of his life, I made curves work, and they worked for me. <laughs> um, ornament and adornment. Morris was really duking out the good fight for ornament on Miami Beach. No one else really wanted, I mean, in his stores, no one else was really doing um, ornaments in the manner that Morris would. He actually was almost like ornamentia. And, you know, if, he, if some people have dementia, he might have had ornamentia. But, um, <laughs> but it was fabulous ornamentia because we all could understand it. I mean, somehow he was playing with all the things that we knew about. You know, he was playing with our, our box set, our little marbles. Um, and the marbles in our mind is what I really mean, the metaphor being. Um, one of the guiding thoughts in our designs was written 2,000 years ago by Vitruvius. He summed up what architecture should have in three words, firmness, fitness, and delight. This has been my creed in all of my work for over 70 years. The most important element, delight. He said, I pulled out all stops. I used bright colors, bold wallpaper. I started warping the walls, twisting them, curving them. I introduced dramatic lighting, which I remembered from my stage days, and neon lighting, which was brand new. And I also introduced ornament. He really duked out the good fight for ornament. And he said, I made curves work. I wanted to do something to people with my designs. And I think he did. I think he succeeded. Um, for 22 years after graduation, Morris Lapidus went into retail store, to dine, store design, and we can see that history recalls in context that he was extremely creative. And some of the things that we see today 
are we take for granted were actually thought about or maybe even done by Lapidus somewhere. We don't have his doors any longer, any of them, none of them exist, but at least we do have photographs of them and we can see how inventive he was. This was the postcard that he would create, putting a montage together, a collage together, of four of his projects that he thought were incredibly successful in 1943 that would sell his idea of architecture. So this is his first market, marketing effort for what would be his first architectural um, firm. 1939 is the World's Fair. We all know about the World's Fair. We don't know, many people don't know, that behind the scenes, not, not only was Lapidus selling merchandise, he was going to sell the greatest merchandise, liquor. Morris would design the Distilled Spirits building. He would work with the Brofman family, and he would work with the Walker family, and he would work with the Bourbon guys, and they would make a distillery building that would go in and explain to America the good of liquor so that we would have the taxation base to build hospitals, build schools, build roads, that we would have, um, that we needed liquor in our um, economy, and we needed to tax it, and it needed to be, um, Anyway, so they, he was selling not just merchandise anymore, but he's selling a good time. He's beginning to sell a good time through liquor and libations. Here's Lapidus, and he's standing over the model that he made to show the distillery building. And I've gifted the full collection of these slides to the Wolfsonian so that they have the full, complete collection. Morris was an actor at first, so he went in and he put on all the different costumes and he showed what a chemist looks like getting to the fifth grain. He showed what it looked like um, making a congener from a, from a juniper bulb. He did all of these things to show America this was going to be a clean industry. This was not moonshine. You didn't have to worry about the, you didn't have to worry about the liquor you're getting. The scientists are making it. So it was a very good thing. And Lapidus um, staged all of those exhibits that you see and he actually um, had murals on all the walls and then little animated machines that would carry uh, corn and carry barley to different destinations to show how it was being processed. So it probably was one of the first interactive environments that was teaching people the good of liquor. We have Morris Lapidus living in New York at the time that you would have um, two songs that might frame this the best. And one is Brother Can I Spare a Dime, and you don't see the name of it, but the, but the review that Brother Can I Spare a Dime came out in was called The Americana, and it was a performance. And then we also have Somewhere Over the Rainbow um, in 1939 came out. Lapidus was one of the great American dreamers. His life in New York and his growing up in New York and strolling time in New York was um, framed by the bookends of these two songs that still today are as memorable. Um, Lapidus was one of the great American dreamers, one of those first generation Americans born with the 20th century who shaped the very tone and texture of our lives and the music shaped him as well. I wanted to put this in as a break because it's very important that I now say Lapidus could have ended his life with stores and could have ended his life working with his father. Leon Lapidus came to him with a request from Admiral Rickover to create a signaling searchlight for the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy. His father said, with this Lapidus, I'll give you $10,000 a month, and if we get the contract, you can start your own firm. That little lamp that you see sitting there is a one-eighth scale model of the actual signaling searchlight that was produced by U.S. Metals, by Leon Metals, by Leon Lapidus with his son, Morris Lapidus, with his other two sons, Saul, and with his other son, Ben, and with his wife watching and his daughter sweeping the floor. The family business created the signaling searchlight that would be used in every safe ship to shore landing all the way through World War II. And on that, Lapidus built his office. Working with the masters, Lapidus would now have enough money from his father and that one commission with his father to now begin working in Miami. He would work with, um, as an associate architect on five iconic Miami Beach properties. These well-known hotels are the subject of this exhibit. And I hope that you all enjoy looking at them. I'm going to go through a series of slides that show the hotels that Morris did with the 
as, as an associate architect, and then I'm going to show the three that he did on his own. Morris Lapidus, it all began with a phone call in 1947. Lapidus was invited by Charlie Spector to meet two men, Harry Mutson and Ben Novak, to design the Sans Souci. Formidable men, Lapidus was going to wind up designing for each of them their first and only infamous hotels on the white sands of Miami Beach. And he wrote a saga, and he says he started the saga by saying, this is a story of searing hate, hate that I became entangled in. This is a story that's not published yet, but I wish that I could. But the story is about 500 pages long, and it's fabulous. And it's the story that built the spite wall on Miami Beach that we are all so happy to know, I mean, which we all probably know about as almost like urban myths, right? But it was really true. And Lapidus in the saga of the Fontainebleau really talked about the searing hate between these two men and how it um, this drove these two properties into existence. The, the searing hate drove the property into existence, one wanting to spite the other. At the Sans Souci, Lapidus did the, um, I, I guess I should mention that all of the graphics that you see at these five hotels were designed by Lapidus. Um, his most um, important element on this building, he said, was the pylon on the front, and I'm he said he was breaking out of the box with the, um, with the, the building on the bottom, he, with the overhangs that he was putting on, he was trying to soften the, um, the rigidness of what he saw as the modern. And on the inside, he would certainly um, make the curves work by um, sashaying the rugs and making paths that curved and making meandering footpaths for people. He, would, he was particularly proud of that back wall, which looks like marble, it's scaglioli, it's a technique that he had learned a long time ago, and he was particularly proud of it. He would go on later to do wallpaper with his nephew and put him in business. I have one sample of the wallpaper on the wall, but um, if you know Robert Swedro and you know Robert Swedro's art, if you look secretly into Robert's art, you can see all the wallpaper that Morris had been making for all of his hotels because Robert was using clippings of it in all of his paintings. It was so pretty fabulous stuff. The, the, um, they were psychedelic. <laughs> Lapidus put a curving bar in at the Sans Souci, and he also is designing those figurines behind the bar. He had a woman in New York that worked with paper mache, and he and C.C. Staples would work together, and they would make these ornaments because you couldn't find them what he wanted, so he was um, inventing them with C.C. He had bird cages above these couches, which didn't go over too well. <laughs> this is the Biltmore. It's a round, um, a round column that he has uh, put lights on. He's put um, all kinds of things on that so that you can hide the fact that it was in the room. I mean, right? He has like camouflaged the column. Um, here you can see just the the edge of the Nautilus, and you see the the canopy that's poking out. He again had an egg crate on this. Which, and a pylon so that it would create a graphic that would make it stand out on the, from the curb. And he's also angling the front entrance. If you notice when you go to that, Architectonica has done a brilliant job of redoing it, although they have a curved wall on the inside that I thought could have cheese holes, it, you know, just for fun. Um, but they did leave the, um, the crenellated on the ground. There were planters that were in the shape of diamonds on the ground, and those diamonds are, go inside and outside. Morris had a secret symbol. His trademark was the bow tie, and in many of his buildings you can find it by looking for diamonds that have been elongated or diamonds that have been foreshortened. Anywhere there's a diamond, look for a pair, and you might find a bow tie. Um, that's the only picture I could get with Carolyn Klepser of the elevation. That was printed in the newspaper, and um, I believe it really looks like not a star, but it looks like that was a woggle originally. Just, I'm not sure about that, but that looks a little woggly. So I, I never went back to the newspaper, but that's... Um, the Algiers is where the Triton is today, was where the Triton is today. And it was one of his, um, I think, more marvelous hotels. Uh, the Turchin family, I think the father ran the bar in, the, in this hotel. Um, this was the pool of the Algiers, and this was the large curving wall at the check-in, and the, um, Morris said that he used about six chartreuse colors, yellow to chartreuse, and that they were um, 
uh, you know, like oscillating. You know, when you walked in, the walls were like a moving. It was almost like coming into a moving um, wall. Um, the Delito um, is um, a hotel that was an L-shaped hotel, um, and it was unusual for Lapidus. He would have to have two entries, and so he'd have to um, choose which one would be the most prominent. And um, the beach side becomes a prominent one for him for driving in and arrival, and he shows that with a mural at the front. Um, and the mural that he had was a real jazz-inspired mural, and um, it still exists today, but it's behind the walkway of the Delito. It has been uh, put there in paint by um, John Nichols uh, when he did the renovation, so it's still there, but you just don't see it as prominently as you saw it before because it's behind a, um, a wall, a glass wall. In the interior, I understood from Lapidus that those circles that go up were hubcaps. And they were lights that, you know, they, he found hubcaps that would work to create light surfaces. And he painted them from pink to dark red. So you can imagine what that would have looked like. And the wall was red. Um, I particularly love the logo, the Delito, and um, I think I put in one right here because if you look at it, it angles. Okay, so why does a sign have to have a background? Why does a sign have to have an angle? When you look at the Delito, it magically looks like it's floating in mist because of the fact that the light has been diffused by having that angled background. So in a way, the, um, the floating of the sign itself, it looks like a ship on a if you look at it at night, it looks very beautiful. This was the hotel room of the Delito, and it was narrow. 13.6 was a standard room size back then for Lapidus. He said, I was determined that this new hotel, talking about now the, the next one he would do, would reflect all the theories that I had evolved during my store designing days. If I had reached people through their basic emotions and love of color and drama in my stores, I could do it in the same way in my hotel design. Here we have the entry to the fountain blue, the fountain blue, the stair to the fountain blue, and the gardens which are no longer with us but which hark back to the original fountain blue in Paris. And by the way, that's a clip of Lapidus in Paris at the fountain blue. And what I do have, but which I haven't shown yet, is a little 30-minute um, video, homemade video of Lapidus that that picture was taken from in Europe when he went on a shopping trip for um, the Eden Rock. Here is um, Lapidus's uh, cabanas that are now gone and the stair to nowhere. The interior, and we see the bow ties. This is the poodle lounge. And he made those little Fragnard-type um, poodles on the wall. He actually even made the, um, the, st the, the stirring stick for the drinks. I have actually one of those. He made a little stir stick with a poodle on it for the poodle room. And this was the Rumpelmeyer room. And C.C. Staples was the one making all of these um, you know, fantastical creatures, uh, you know, people delivering your food. And um, this was the lobby. Again, he's using carpet to kind of direct people through. And this was one of his doors into a theater. This was the boom boom room. And Morris had always a bar in his house, but this was one of his favorites. Again, the Rumpelmeyer room. And this would be the, um, what the fountain blue would look like originally and the Eden Rock. Jules Muffs, uh, Muffson wanted him to go to Europe to do a, uh, a shopping trip. He said, Lapidus, I'm going to use this as PR for the hotel. We want it to be more outlandish than the Fountain Blue. Go and spend as much money as you need to, but bring me back all that gook you use. <laughs> bring back all the good gook you can. <laughs> And so Lapidus had a wonderful time with his wife. And by the way, that would be the first time Lapidus would go to Europe. So when he designed the Fountain Blue, it's interesting, he would have done that through books only. 
all this ornament. He's not looking at this from an, a, a literate man who's going to Europe for five visits, six visits, ten visits, who can rattle off what he's... No, he's shopped on 2nd Avenue in the um, antiques for the... Um, he was the saint of Second Avenue because he was buying so much of that stuff at that time. But um, the, you can see a difference in the Eden Rock because he's experienced Europe and he's bringing back a real sense of Europe in the in the interior. This is the exterior, two of the exteriors. Those balconies were almost lost in 19, I guess in 2005 when John Nichols was redoing, no, when whoever it was that was redoing, I think it was John Nichols redoing the Eden Rock, they wanted to take the balconies and get rid of them and put glass instead. So there was quite a, a little bit of a roar back then at that time, I remember. I had to go on TV and say, you can't do this. <laughs> um, so we saved the balconies on that building. And this is a Marco Polo silk um, wall, it, silk, silk mural, and um, I think it was quite lovely. Lapidus would say he loved putting that in. Of course, because of the connection to Venice and the connection to Italy and all the merchants coming from, um, from the Orient that were bringing things in through Italy, and he wanted to honor that traveling man that had brought so many great wares all over the world, right? We're getting back to his Hasidic roots, and he wants to say, I love these people. <laughs> these merchants are my people, <laughs> and he's, he's loving Marco Polo. This is the stair that he did wireframes of the balustrades, which was very unusual. You don't see a balustrade. It's all of a sudden now, the architecture is becoming transparent, even more transparent. And he's enlarged the, um, he's enlarged the leaf that is just a flower, and he's turned that into a complete inset into the floor. So he's really considered, because of these two elements, the father of pop of uh, postmodernism, because of these two elements in one of the books by Whitney. And this is the um, a, a wonderful dining room, and the chandeliers are Venetian glass. And this was the Mona Lisa room, and he said that when he was going through uh, uh, the balcony in, um, and when he was going through a lobby in an airport lobby coming home, he saw a guy pa painting um, the masters and he asked if he would paint them for this room. And so he had 14, he had these paintings shipped over from them from this man that he had met in the airport. <laughs> so talk about a great, you know, a great intersection, you know, like a random coincidence. It's fabulous that we have the Mona Lisa room. And what else came from that? That song, right? Nat King Cole singing Mona Lisa. Okay, we all know where that goes. Um, this is the Americana. And um, the story of the Americana is the contract that he almost lost because he had gone off again designing. I mean, he was off shopping again with his wife somewhere. And the Tishes saw the design that he had left with his brilliant designer. And um, they said, Morris, we want a meeting. And he went to the meeting and they said, this isn't you. We don't want this. And uh, I mean, they said, we don't like this. We're going to pay you, but we don't want this design. And, um, and Lapidus came back with, I won't accept the money on the condition that you tell me why you don't want this design. And they said, we know it's not you. Somebody else did this. We wanted a Lapidus. And so he said, give me a week and I'll give you a Lapidus. And then <laughs> that's how he got the, that's, that is the truth. Lapidus thought he was going to be seared and fried if he didn't get the Americana Commission because, you know, he had already um, said that he was. He had already put in press that he had gotten it. So he fought for this commission. I'm not really talking about the facades of the buildings because I'm afraid I'd go on for an hour about one facade, but I want to let you know that Lapidus was very interested in light, very interested in shade, very interested in controlling light, angling windows, and making sure that the uh, tenants always had a view to the ocean and that the light was very much controlled. So if his facades somehow look like egg crates or they look like they have um, things going on with the sun, it's absolutely true they do. If you want a significant piece of architecture that tells you that. It's at 16. His office building shows that. All four of the Brisele that he put on that office building at 1680 Meridian, that is, each side has a different texture to it and has a different um, design for the different types of lighting. Um, and this was the uh, Americana. 
bar, and this was the famous terrarium that had an alligator in it. And Morris designed all those um, hanging fixture, all those hanging things. These were the mosaics that were put up by um, Anton Refarge. They are now in Tallahassee, and they need to be restored. Um, this is what the beach looked like at the time that Lapidus was there building, and this is him enjoying life in his Thunderbird. Beth Dunlop in 1990 would write, in more flamboyant times, the 50s and the 60s, it was Morris Lapidus who created the Miami Beach look with the Fountain Blue, the Eden Rock, and the Americana Hotels. Vast lobbies were virtual stage sets for vacationers with grand staircases to nowhere and colossal chandeliers. It became the stuff of Miami lore. I just wanted to mention that this will be a talk about Lincoln Road, and at the time that Morris had done the big hotels, they all were losing business on Lincoln Road. At that time, Pop Sirkin owned about four properties on Lincoln Road, the Albion Hotel, the Lincoln One, the Delito, and um, he owned the West End as well as the East End. And so when the proposal came for Lincoln Road, Pop said, I'm not letting you have the beach to bay not on my blocks. I want traffic coming through. So the reason the Lincoln Road is the length that it was was because Pop Sirkin would not allow at the bay, beach and the bay. And I think that was a good thing, actually. I think the, the 1,200 feet of the, the blocks that we have of Lincoln Road are great. We have, um, and I think it made the bullying of these, I mean, the battle between these two men actually made for a better mall. But we'll get into that next time. <laughs> I do want to end with this being the picture, though, that Hal Hertz presented to Morris and said, Morris, you're bullying us with all your hotels. The people are not coming to our mall anymore. Can you help us? And Morris designed Lincoln Road Pro Bono. I hope I've set the scene. Okay, well, thank you so much, Deborah, uh, for setting the scene for us. Now we are going to bring in Arlene Pavone, PhD, JD, retired professor, School of Architecture and Engineering Technology at Florida A&M University. Arlene Pavone holds a PhD from Northwestern University as well as a JD an MARC, and a BED from the University of Puerto Rico. With the highest GPA of her graduating class, she obtained the Henry Adams AIA Medal in 1974. Since 1979, she has taught undergraduate and graduate courses at the University of Puerto Rico and Florida A&M University in the areas of architectural history, architectural theory and philosophy, architectural design, and historic preservation. At both institutions, she served as assistant and associate dean. Dr. Pavone was Puerto Rico's state historic preservation officer twice. She is a member of the Washington, D.C. Bar, as well as a trustee emeritus of both the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Puerto Rico Conservation Trust. In addition, she is a corresponding academician of the St. Jordi Royal Academy of Fine Arts, Catalonia a consultant in architectural history, historic preservation, and cultural interpretation. She is also an instructor at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Florida State University. Um, I'd like to thank the Miami Design Preservation League for this invitation. Miami is very close to my heart, and I'm very much interested in um, its past, it's present. Let's are capable of creating diverse, valued, and lovely textiles. The same applies to architectural strands. Mine is but one interpretation of Lapidus work. To understand Lapidus, we must review the centuries old tradition of interior architecture that started in France during the 16th century and was democratized in Miami during the 20th century. In addition, we must reflect on the slurs directed at his work. To be sure, he's not the first architect whose work has been snubbed. 
the creator of the marvel that is the dome of Florence Cathedral, Virtuoso Filippo Brunelleschi, was called a buffon and a babbler to his face when he first presented his solution. Yes, the same solution that's still standing there after so many centuries. Uh, four, five centuries later, many failed to understand the originality of Antonio Gaudí's architectural masterpieces, comparing the superb Mila house to an ugly blimp garage. Interesting, it was not the public, but the quote unquote intelligentsia who hated the works. To this day, this self-appointed group pretends to dictate what is right and wrong in architecture. Some have gone beyond nasty descriptions and drawings when analyzing architectural examples. Roman architect Apollodorus of Damascus was highly critical of Emperor Hadrian's forays as temple designer, stating the goddess to whom the building was dedicated would not like the interior's low ceiling. The upset emperor banished him from Rome, and a few weeks later, Apollodorus suffered a fatal quote unquote accident that killed him. In spite of Hadrian's fame as one of the good emperors, there was only so much he could take when his design was being ridiculed. During the 20th century, the architectural critic appeared on the scene, hawking opinions on buildings to newspapers and magazines. Early ones were dilettantes who lacked formal education as architects, that they purported to know everything about the art. Their work requires them to be entertaining, and some are known by their witty comparisons and funny semantics. One such individual was Miss Ada Louise Huxtable, famed for her legendary description of Lapidus' work as uninspired super schlop, among other niceties. Yiddish for rubbish or trash, schlop derives from the German word slap. I use the term in the title of this presentation in this sense, as something that stops us in our tracks and makes us see things in a new manner. Lapidus collected negative press throughout his life, a fact that demeans and obscures his work and forces any serious analysis to start with a consideration of these uneducated descriptions. Let's analyze the criticism garnered by his unique interior architecture. By the time Lapidus designed his hotels, the decorated interior tradition was centuries old and considered an essential part of the profession. Our architect believed that since architecture is one of the three fine arts, it is all about beauty. A corollary of this ideal is that beauty needs to be explored in both the interior and the exterior of a building. This vantage point became commonplace during the 16th century in the French palaces or chateau created for King François Premier. Each and every one of these structures was conceived as a chest guarding a magical inside packed with enchanting decoration. It is important to remember, however, that only the aristocracy could enjoy such magnificence at the time. For centuries then, architects have been fixated on the creation of unique interior spaces, places that move the soul while presenting breathtaking spectacles. Interiors are conceived as part of the holistic organism that is the building. 19th century aesthetic movements like the arts and crafts, the Catalan Modernisme and the Art Nouveau exemplify this fixation. Early 20th century architecture 
further underscore the concept that architecture is not just about the building, but about what happens inside. Furniture and even the owner's clothing were subject of interest. Peter Behrens, Frank Lloyd Wright, Miss van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, to name but a few 20th century architectural giants, tried their hand at the creation of holistic interiors. While Miss Huxtable was aghast at such an interest, Lapidus colleagues were surely not surprised. For Lapidus, the interior of a building is a meaningful cocoon designed to make us feel at ease and enjoy our sojourn. In the case of a beach hotel, the recreational interior allows us to relish the exceptional experience that a vacation by the ocean represents. No architect, no matter how exceptional and inventive, lives in a bubble. Like all artists, they are the product of their time and most importantly, validate millennia old traditions. There is nothing super schlock in Lapidus work. He was just following a traditional approach to the profession, creating beautiful exteriors and interiors. A building reflects the culture it serves, shaping its locale while reflecting the physical and emotional context producing it. There is nothing superficial about Lapidus' work, unless we consider recreational hotels and the people who stay in them superficial. I started exploring the second architectural strand after I moved to Florida several decades ago. According to some, there are few examples of architectural distinction in our state. This dismissal reminds me that during the 19th century, Midwestern architects referred to their colleagues from the Eastern seaboard as quote unquote, gentlemen designers, a sniggering name that imply their designs were less relevant. The nickname implicitly established they belonged to a different quote unquote breed of architects who paid homage to historicist expressions rather than to the quote unquote masculine prototypes characterizing the Windy City. Midwesterners thought their Eastern colleagues dependence on eclectic models made for an effeminate and shallow architecture, hence the use of the nickname. There is a similar contempt towards Florida's architecture, perhaps a reflection of a certain contempt for the state where supposedly nothing serious happens and where hundreds come to die. The criticism Lapidus faced is mirrored in the early disparagements made about Arquitectonica's magnificent work and the negative critiques garnered by the new urbanism concepts, two of Florida's most relevant contributions to architecture. Coral Gables, innovative architecture is seldom if ever considered when analyzing 20th century national examples of architecture. This is so because the project rejected modernist models in favor of a unique Floridian one. Architecturally speaking, the rest of the nation looks over its shoulder at Florida's architectural inventory. The facts, new urban and architectural types like the subdivision, the beach hotel, the beach house, the apartment building, among others, reached full maturity in our state, exemplifying our ability to develop a unique style to suit our weather, our taste, and our personality, is undermined by the idea that we are singular to start with, and not in a nice way. 
Lapidus' criticism was leveled by those who believe that architecture that pleases the senses, empowers recreational activities, and interacts with nature is not serious architecture. Ms. Huxtable probably thought, dear Lord, not content to create dozens of quote unquote, eye candy, her words, are deco fanciful buildings, the Floridians even paint some of their buildings pink. She incorrectly assumed Lapidus and his Miami architecture were shallow because the buildings appeal to the senses, creating recreational stages where joy can be experienced. Such criticism might have been rooted in an antipathy to the democratization of palatial vacations. In the old days, only the extravagantly rich were able to experience vacations. Only aristocrats experienced beautiful interiors. An elegant place by the sea was even more exclusive. In fact, the first European examples that influence, influence Lapidus, that is hotels facing the sea, were resorts created for the very rich. Lapidus made possible for the common folk to stay in, the, in a beachfront hotel and enjoy a similar experience. Granted, you needed to save money to, in order to pay for your stay, but there was no need to be a rich rubber baron or an aristocrat to live, if only for a few days, in an awesome palace that seemed to be far away from everyday travails. This brings me to the last architectural strand I would like to analyze tonight. Any interpretation of an architect's work must start with the following question. What is architecture? Is it the solution to a functional problem? And yes, it is. However, quote unquote functional problems have various layers. Some are physical, for example, a contemporary house should have a kitchen and at least one bathroom. While some are metaphysical, a house is first and foremost a home where dwelling of the body and the soul takes place. A hospital needs to have rooms for patients and operating rooms for surgeons. These are givens. It should also create an environment that helps humans to deal with the joys and suffering of life. Architecture is a language that communicates ideas and emotions, a place that offers succor and delight. Lapidus created a quote unquote architecture of joy, which required breaking traditions in order to create an environment that underscores empathy by means of bewilderment. His stairs to nowhere, for example, do serve in the traditional manner, that is, they take you up and down. While there are also a place to sit, where you can meditate on your own or chat with friends while contemplating the busy atmosphere of a hotel lobby. A crazy idea? Not crazy enough, according to the Kyoto Central train station architect who created an even longer stairs to nowhere that are the central anchor of his building. By the way, the idea that a staircase is not a traditional uh, area, transitional area, sorry, but a place in its own right, goes all the way to the 16th and 17th centuries, if not before. Some of Lapidus' ideas are still impacting designers as seen in this 2020 project that won inter the International Architecture Awards and made use of his quote unquote, cheese holes as decorating strategy. This reality makes us question if Lapidus influence is seen in dozens of luxury hotels set in a beach or not, and shopping malls and international buildings. Why was he criticized? 
Miss Huxtable and other critics were living at the height of the so-called international style, a 20th century mode of creating architecture that depends on a formalist approach to the art. Form follows function, form is function, less is more, are some of the theoretical vantage points of this particular stylistic methodology. Ms. Huxtable followed the trend of the times by request, requesting architecture be exclusively an expression of the building's physical function. A hotel for her was just a group of rooms with a lobby since she and others interpreted the building as a means to an end. Lapidus, on the other hand, saw the building as a place that allows us to grasp our consciousness. Consciousness is the state of being awake, truly awake, when we are perfectly attuned to our surroundings and our emotions. In other words, the building becomes a stage empowering us to be in the moment. These are the two basic uh, theoretical approaches. Ms. Huxtable was obviously influenced by the trends of the time using the formalist approach to architecture. While um, Lapidus and the word was not used in the context of architecture at this point, but we can say that he was embracing a more phenomenological approach to architecture. Let me explain a bit what the difference between these two theoretical points is by trying to describe to you how I feel about some hotels. Even today, after many visits to hotels around the world and many encounters with fancy hoteliers over myriad issues, including bed books, no, they are not normal. Staying in a hotel brings a sense of delight, of time suspended, of being a full participant in a new world. I seldom have the chance to enjoy vacations in a hotel by the sea. For one, it costs too much money. Or I'm allowed to embrace such an experience as often as I wish. Staying in a hotel close to the water in Miami, Hong Kong, or Barcelona is a rare treat that was even rarer in Lapidus time. It is a moment in time when we feel relaxed. Time is suspended when we give shape to a home away from home. Opening hotel room doors to a balcony above a beautiful ocean or a green rambla, hearing centuries old bells toll, spying upon the dark wine that is the Mediterranean or Hong Kong's busy port from hotel windows are some of my most precious vacation memories. They defy time and are possible because of good hotel designs. As an architect, Lapidus undertook an enormous task, creating, and I'm quoting from a description of uh, a hotel, not designed by him, but that was part of this movement, a wealth of wide wonderment. By making concrete walls underscore our pleasure when facing the blue ocean from a balcony, a fanciful lobby with a set of stairs apparently going nowhere or a playful pool deck. Even though the first Florida tourist hotels were constructed in St. Augustine during the 19th century, beach hotels are a uniquely ar Miami architectural type invented during the 1950s and 1960s. There was no precedent, although some of Lapidus' ideas stem from very ancient buildings. There was no precedent for the new society that emerged at the time, a culture that had won a world war and had the time and money to enjoy recreational periods close to the sea. Lapidus served a nation where baby boomers sat down to eat Cantonese food. This is the quote in the photograph, uh, in the historic photograph, still consider an exotic activity that deserved a unique stage like the Carioca Lounge. I feel we owe Lapidus an apology. He deserves better. 
we deserve better. Let's thank great architects who allow us to enjoy our lives, even if in a super schlock manner. Life is too stressful and too short not to try to love every second of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arlene. And um, uh, stand by because we will have a time for Q&A. Um, and now we're going to go to our final speaker, uh, Mr. Dr. Alex Quinlan. Okay, Dr. Quinlan's poetry, nonfiction, and reviews have appeared in the Belois Poetry Journal and Tampa Review, among others. He's received awards and fellowships from the AWP Intro Journals Project, the Academy of American Poets, the Bucknell Seminar for Younger Poets, and the Vermont Studio Center. And he has served as editor-in-chief of the Southeast Review, as well as a contributing editor at the Tusculum Review. And Dr. Quinlan is our first speaker who is visiting from out of town. He's come from Chattanooga today to be here, so we're very thankful for that. And uh, Dr. Quinlan has a master's in fine arts poetry at Washington University in St. Louis, where following graduation, he was third year fellow in poetry. And he also has a PhD in English with a focus on poetry and cultural studies. And uh, from Florida State University, where he was given an outstanding graduate student career award. And he's been a lecturer with the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. So welcome, Dr. Quinlan. Just want to make sure before I get started. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for coming out. Thanks to the Miami Design Preservation League for inviting me to come and participate in this really dynamic program. Apparently, you can't hear me. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you were the only one who spoke. It's like I always tell my students. I always tell my students, if you've got a question and you think it's stupid, just, just keep in mind that probably three or four other people have it uh, and uh, speak up. So thank you so much. Um, and I'll, I'll do what I can here with my, I wish I had a third hand, but you know, uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so uh, as you can probably tell from Daniel's uh, bio, uh, I am, sorry, there's, um, I'm, I'm coming at this issue from a slightly different angle. You know, Deb was a, you know, a collaborator with, with Lapidus. Uh, Dr. Pabone is, is, a, is an art historian and an architect. Um, I'm looking a little bit more broadly at the cultural impact of Lapidus's design philosophy, uh, and thus uh, I'm thinking uh, about Morris Lapidus and the, the architecture of appetite. Um, too much is never enough. And here we've got the, the stairs to nowhere, which we'll, we'll discuss. Uh, later on in the talk. So who is Morris Lapidus and what is his legacy? That's, that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, well, it's a, it's a long story. It's a story about America and it's a story about a boy, a boy from Odessa, Russia, who came to New York before he had formed his first memory, who failed at everything, actor, set designer, x-ray technician, until there was nothing left to do but succeed. Here's a, uh, a painting that uh, Lapidus uh, created. He was, he, was, he was quite a painter, actually. And, and this is, this is uh, what he called, uh, the title of this is My World at Five. And it's, it's his, um, his digs in the Lower East Side. Um, he failed at everything until there was nothing left to do but succeed. A boy raised amid hard scrabble poverty who fell in love with the idea of opulence, joy, and himself, becoming a precursor to postmodern architecture in the process. Here was an immigrant boy who grew into a visionary designer and salesman of the American dream, whose ultimate product above and beyond the structures that define both the landscape of Miami Beach and the cultural moment he occupied was an idea, something we all want to believe, even if our puritanical selves are loath to admit it. We can have it all. 
here's a, a photo of, of Lapidus with one of his friends uh, indulging in his, his more theatrical side, right? They're kind of playing as railroad hobos. Uh, but in fact, uh, Lapidus' early childhood was, uh, uh, that the poverty was not a fantasy for him. And, and one moment from, from his early life that he discusses in his autobiography that I feel hangs over everything uh, I know about him was a story from when he was about five years old and his mother had, uh, with what little money they had, scraped together uh, some nice school outfits for the boys, uh, brand new knickerbocker pants and blouses and, 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 and a very cheap uh, button-up leather boots and uh, implored the children not to, not to allow anything to happen to these wonderful clothes that she had, she, she had scraped together to, to buy for them. And the first day they go out in them, uh, they see some children who are sliding down a, a hill in their neighborhood, a big grassy hill, um, uh, down a big slick rock. You know, the schist, that, that thick, that, that real dense granite that, that they have in the, in, in the Northeast. And uh, they promptly forgot their mother's words and came home after spending all afternoon sliding down the hill with their friends and, and, uh, and full of joy. Um, and when she saw their clothes, she took one look at them and said, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you what it's like to break your mother's heart. And she beat them both savagely to the point that Lapidus wished his own mother's death aloud uh, in, uh, in, in his brother's presence and, and would not back down from that wish uh, even though his brother begged him to. So this, this desire for a good time, right? This desire to escape the bonds of, 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 of poverty is something that, that is born in Lapidus, not, not merely out of a, a longing for the you know, the, the, the joy of luxury, but to escape the dire straits of poverty. So what's the legacy uh, of Morris Lapidus? Uh, Dave Hickey calls Lapidus the king of Miami Beach and the Fountain Blue uh, Hotel Miami, uh, Lapidus signature, signature achievement, uh, a multifaceted cultural monument that marked the rebirth of Miami Beach as a luxury resort and today informs the insouciant look of the beach itself, Lapidus Land, as it might be called. And it's true. Even the crosswalks bear as trademark curves and burst with bright pastels. And while it would be plenty enough on its own, the more I learn about the man and the architecture, and the architect who was Morris Lapidus, the more I see his fingerprints all over contemporary culture. And this is what I really want to talk to you about. The same way that they are all over Miami Beach. Castigated by critics and tastemakers in his own time, as, as Dr. Pabone told us, uh, you know, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Miss Huxtable, um, and, and we'll, we'll hear more from her shortly. Lapid has nonetheless produced a body of architectural work of remarkable variety and volume, and I would also add that it was visionary. In contrast to the prevailing international style, perhaps best summed up in Mies van der Rohe's dictum, Less is More, the playful exuberance of Lapidus's work winkingly replies, too much is never enough. This opens the door for an architect like Robert Venturi to claim years later that less is a bore, and he also paves the way for the queen of the curve, Zaha Hadid. But as we'll see, the impact his impact broke the bounds of the architectural establishment and spread into the culture at large. While the Fountain Blue Hotel Miami marks the birth of Morris Lapidus, the architect, it was the first project that he was the lead architect in, actually. The philosophy of design upon which it was founded was constructed shop window by shop window in Jazz Age New York. It was the laboratory where Lapidus began to refine his mythical American landscape of consumable dreams, as David Hickey calls it. And this is his actually his first uh, commissioned sketch. It was for, um, uh, it was a decoration above the uh, a garage door um, in a, a Vanderbilt house that was being built in a Spanish style. 
And if you can see here, um, this head of, of the god, the Greek god Mercury, uh, was, was Labidus's sort of signature contribution. He, um, uh, the initial design had a, a horse and carriage uh, over it, and he recognized this as an anachronism, and and replaced it, and 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 uh, you know, kind of won his boss's favor at the time. He was like a junior architect at, at uh, the first firm after he he had finished graduate school, um, and that forward lookingness, that that desire to occupy the moment. Uh, and to grasp for the future rather than to repeat and reiterate the past, I think, really defines him uh, as, a, as, a, as an architect and as a contributor to our broader culture. So just quickly, um, although Deb's already spoken about it a little bit, uh, you know, some of these storefronts, um, there's one element in particular uh, about these storefronts that I want to draw to your attention, and it's the... It's the use of, of curvature. Um, so the the store the, the the sidewalk runs right here down along the bottom um, of the frame, and as you can see, the the door to the store, the actual entrance to the store, is offset from the street, probably fifteen to twenty feet, and between that. Between the, the 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 aperture at the at the street and the door to the store is this window that comes out and curves, and half obscures it. And and what Lapidus noticed is that when people were walking down the street, they would they would you know you had to have a reason to draw them in. You you had to have a reason for them to stop and and come into your store, and that that hiding things. Almost, not, not quite hiding them, obscuring them, uh, putting them almost out of view had this tantalizing effect on people who uh, passers-by. And so they would stop and they would look at the window and then they would start to move in and, and see more of, the, more of the goods that were on display. And, and this is actually a place where, where Lapidus and, and Van der Rohe actually agree with each other that less is more. He was always telling, as, as I'm sure you saw in the exhibit, always telling his clients, don't put everything in the window. Uh, just, just put a few things, uh, tantalize them, lure them in, and and so you see this principle uh, very well in, in display here. Um, the he talks about the way the brass, uh, the curvature of the brass would 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 draw people in, and they would be essentially, uh, as he says, a pedestrian unconsciously followed the curve and found himself or herself entering the store front vestibular arcade. Um, without even realizing they'd done so. And here's uh, Mangle's uh, department store uh, for, for women, which has the distinction of being, and, and this, is, this is something that I think will really uh, demonstrate how revolutionary Lapidus is as a, as a designer and architect. This was the first store in, a, in, in history that was painted, the interior was painted in more than one color. And now I would challenge you to find a place anywhere on Miami Beach where the interior is only one color. I, I, I don't know if you could do it. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe. But, but it, would be, it would be seen as a deficiency, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the influence is great, right? Okay, so on to the, the, the fountain blue, which is what I really want to uh, discuss here. So um, the fountain blue had, writes Dave Hickey, nothing to do with luxury hotels of the past and everything to do with luxury hotels of the future. And he puts it up there with the Cadillac tail fin, the starburst clock, and the boomerang table as icons of mid-century uh, modernism, uh, and of course you can put a little asterisk by that, right? Uh, Lapidus himself claimed that he was a modernist uh, over and over again, uh, reasserted that claim. Um, but really, I think what we see him doing is kicking open the door to, to the postmodern era um, in a lot of ways. And here's Zaha Hadid. This is in Miami. This Right? Isn't that just a beautiful? I mean, the, the biomorphic shapes there, it looks like it's breathing, right? It looks like a, it's this whale of a building. 
And this is uh, a concert hall in Azerbaijan. Lapid has told Hickey that my negative example when I was designing the, the Fountain Blue was this building, the Biltmore and Coral Gables, with its dark spaces and off-putting aura of old-time gentility. This is Miami Beach before Lapid has got to it. There's the Firestone Estate there. And that, this, so this is the ground upon which Fountain Blue would be erected. And, you know, adjacent to it is where the Eden Rock is now, right? Um, and this is it when he was done with it. So quite a transformational effect. So how did he achieve it? Well, he says, I finally realized that American taste was being influenced by the greatest mass media of entertainment of that time, the movies. So I designed a movie set. I imagined myself the set designer for a movie producer who wanted to create a hotel that would make a tremendous impression on the viewers. I never for a moment let my client, Ben Novak, know what I was doing. And that, and that, that sentiment, right, that, that he never wanted to let Ben Novak know what he was doing, uh, I think is a very, very telling about Lapidus. And I think also helps explain maybe some of the similarities between him and someone like Mies van der Rohe, right? Uh, who assumed that if, if, his, uh, if the people who lived in his buildings didn't like them, that it was their fault, right? Because <laughs> um, he knew what he was doing, right? Um, well, Lapidus knew what he was doing too, and I think he was quite convinced of it. But he had the gift, he had, he had the showman's gift of persuasion. He had the ability to make Novak think that all the ideas were his, uh, which, which he discusses uh, in, in great detail at his, uh, in, in, his, in his autobiography. Um, so, looks like, okay. Just use this. That's fine. All right, cool. I still have my laser pointer. Okay. Um, so, any style, as long as it's yours. It was, uh, I don't know where, I saw it on a furniture store when we were driving in uh, across the bridge. And it struck me, uh, it's this sort of this motto, right, uh, for this furniture store in, 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 in Brickle. And, and it, it made me think of, of that that would be a perfect, a perfect motto. Uh, for, for Lapidus and, and the way that he worked with his clients, right? Any style as long as it's yours, and then in parentheses, as long as it's mine, right? <laughs> um, but these, these theatrical spaces that he designed, and this is, uh, this is actually a still from the, the show The Marvelous Miss Maisel, if anyone has seen it. Um, uh, when she comes to Miami, she stays at the Fountain Blue and performs there. Um, and, and so this... this space of, of the lobby and of, again, the stairs to nowhere um, really is iconic in, in capturing that, that moment in, in, in mid-century America when and everything became about seeing and being seen. And here she is being seen. So one way to understand the influence of architecture and of a designing mind like the one Lapidus possessed is to see how its basic tenets reverberate or more appropriate when describing such a shimmering and sensuous set of surfaces and settings as those Lapidus stages for us to enter and act and be seen in, reflect and refract across the cultural moment we now occupy, writ broadly. He's a democratic design. His is a democratic design of enchantment and pleasure an orgy of appetites that reflects the immigrant's faith that America can be, as David Hickey has noted, not just anything, but everything. This is, of course, an illusion. But it's an illusion in the grip of which we find ourselves held as fiercely as ever. 
It culminates in an economy of theme where the final product is oneself, commodified in the pageant of scopophilic elaborations produced by the information economy. Translate, Instagram. It is significant that both phases of Lapidus's maturation as an architect, the Jazz Age New York storefronts and the Miami Beach hotels, both came in the wake of global cataclysm. World War I and the 1918 H1N1 flu pandemic in the first case, the Great Depression and World War II in the second. The Fountain Blue captures a moment in American culture when the commercial class was becoming, and indeed coming to assert itself as co-equal in a culture when the commercial class, when the, uh, the um, uh, in a culture that had long been dominated by the, uh, by the professional and financial classes. It was long the custom of this latter group, the professionals, the financiers. As uh, Jane Jacobs notes in her Systems of Survival, to pursue unstructured leisure time, take a fishing trip for, for recreation. While the commercial classes seek luxury, comfort, and convenience, easy fun in a hurry, one might say. And these fun seekers were Lapidus's initial audience, at least. He, he created commercial Edens for the commercial classes, earning him the scorn of critics like Ada Louise Huxtable, who wears, who wears it like a jeweled brooch. She writes that, I have never felt more joyless than in, the, in, than in Miami in the midst of all that joy. And it's true, there's no lonelier place in the world in the midst of a party where one feels unwelcome. It is as if Huxtable embodies the position of a dialectical materialist without actually understanding it. Marx powerfully urges us, Frederick Jameson writes, to do the impossible, namely to think of the historical development of capitalism itself and the deployment of a specific bourgeois culture, which Dr. Pabone just so uh, beautifully uh, commemorated in, in her, in her uh, the final portion of her talk, um, both positively and negatively at once, to achieve a type of thinking that would be capable of grasping the demonstrably baleful features of capitalism along with its extraordinary and liberating dynamism simultaneously within a single thought. We are somehow to lift our minds to a point at which it is possible to understand that capitalism is at one and the same time the best thing that has ever happened to the human race and the worst. Or as Huxtable says, capturing this tension between the commercial class on one hand and on the other, the financial and professional classes. To those who have always loved what he does, it is super glamor. To the young and older professionals who have recently come to love it, it is super camp. They savor every nuance of legitimate psychology and outrageous parody and translate it into homilies about the pop scene that are sincere, but not without the scent of patronage. Morris Lapidus was a maven of social media. If you don't believe me, just read his autobiography. Of course, his heyday was long before the birth of the internet, and he passed on before Facebook was even founded. But So his version was a combination of the newspaper and the telephone. All throughout his career, you'll find him sitting at the newspaper, reading something, usually about himself, and then calling someone on the phone or receiving a call. This is actually how he found out he got his first big break designing the Fountain Blue. He read Ben Novak was gonna build a, a hotel in Miami Beach, and a reporter asked him who was gonna be the architect, and he just picked Lapidus's name out of his brain without even consulting him first. So Andy Warhol is famous for saying, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. That, and, and you know, so here's, and, and this is the, uh, the show uh, at, in, uh, at a, the, um, the museum in, in Malmo, a retrospective of his work that, um, that, you know, this quote appeared in the program and apparently he never actually did say it. But that he never said it is entirely fitting and beside the point. Uh, Warhol's aesthetic, according to art critic H.D. Uh, Buchlow, 
proceeds from the systematic invalidation of hierarchies of representational functions and techniques of art. One consequence of this is that the operative principle of that, that the hierarchy of subjects worthy to be represented will someday be abolished, opening the glittery portal of fame to all, a democratization of the promotional apparatus of consumer capitalism. From the vantage point of 1968, Warhol saw the world as it came to be. The corrosive thrill of public attention fixes its eye on anyone and everyone at any given moment. As a result, to be anyone at all, everyone must have a brand, a look, a pose. President Biden's inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman, who wowed in a yellow Prada coat, signed not a book deal, but a modeling contract with IMG, no less, in the days following her turn on that most hallowed of national stages. Warhol was right and he was wrong. Almost no one is world famous anymore, so fragmented is the mediascape that conveys and capitalizes on our attention. In today's world, everyone gets to feel famous for 15 minutes, five seconds at a time. The stairs to nowhere in the lobby of the Fountain Blue Hotel just did just that. Ascending in an elegant curve to not nowhere exactly, but a coat closet. The stairs served a crucial and frivolous function. They allowed guests, having put their coats away, the pleasure of being seen, of being glamorous in a glamorous place, of feeling whether they came from Montauk or the Atlanta suburbs, if only for a moment, famous. There's a paradox at the heart of Lapidus's architecture, or perhaps it is more accurate to say that Lapidus is an architect of paradox. His exacting vision, excuse me, his exacting vision is achieved through compromise. The sense of freedom one gets inhabiting his works is the product of control. Their openness, a byproduct of their boundedness. They are spatial in an experiential way. The stairs to nowhere exploit curvature, elevation, concealment, not as strictly functional principles, but in order to facilitate a kind of experience, the glamorous illusion of fleeting fame. That it is ultimately vanity should go without saying, except to say that the word itself means emptiness, a something the very essence of which is nothing. We see the contemporary apotheosis of this in social media culture and its analogs in the built environment. The Instagram wall, the selfie museum, which eloquently articulate the economy of self-curation, promotion, and commodification. We are the product. But this is only the beginning of the illusion. Themes dominate contemporary American society, writes poet Mary Rufel, musing on Celebration Florida, Polar Tech Fabric, and the Las Vegas Strip, among other things. The true theme of the Fountain Blue Miami and the resort hotel writ large is not joy, is not pleasure, it is dominance over nature. Frederick Jameson and Mary Rufel both characterized the postmodern moment as a cultural paradigm defined primarily by its subjects' inability to locate themselves in time and space. As Kevin Lynch writes, the alienated city is above all a space in which people are unable to map in their minds either their own positions or the urban totality in which they find themselves. Lapidus, on the other hand, is an architect not of hyperspace, as Jameson says Portman is, but instead he is an architect of what might be called hyperplace, location raised to the power of theme. In this way, Miami Beach represents Niagara Falls, which is constantly being maintained so it can seem so powerful and so natural to the visitors who, who flock there every year. 
there's a haunting irony then in the curvature of the fountain blue, which in part is modeled on the storefront arcades Lapidus developed and are meant to draw in the passerby. The curve is part function, part spectacle. It facilitates airflow. Sorry. It facilitates airflow, right? It, it's bringing in the, the ocean breezes and it maximizes oceanfront views. But now, in the age of climate change, it seems to beckon the very ocean the way those storefronts once beckoned the passerby. Here is a projection. Uh, this is the current map of Miami Beach uh, from NOAA. Um, and what follows are projections for Miami Beach uh, in the year 2060. Uh, and that blue is water inundation of sea level rise. Uh, again, uh, fountain blue is here in this, roughly here where this red dot is. So in 2060, it's still just barely above water. Um, this is 2080, four feet of sea level rise. And this is 2100, uh, an estimated six feet of, of rise. So where can the legacy of Morris Lapidus be found? In short, it's, it's everywhere. And in particular, I'd like to invite you to consider the, the haunting irony of a place like Fountain Blue that stays the same even as the land around it changes and in fact disappears, where the illusion of mid-century opulence breaks. Thank you so much, Alex, and um, uh, all of the speakers. Uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions, raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Any questions of the audience? Yes. Uh, I would like to know if the person that knew Mr. Lapidus uh, knew why the Americana Hotel was demolished and if something was done to avoid such a tragedy. Mr. Lapidus at that time had felt that the Americana had already been destroyed by all the interior designers that had taken all of his art and had ruined it on the interior. He even refused to go into the interior of the Americana at the time of, at, when I would take him to lunch at Bal Harbor, I would say, let us go see the Americana. And he would say, no, it is not my Americana. So uh, fortunately, um, when George Perez did demolish the building, before the demolition was done, the Anton Refugee mosaics were recovered from the building by George Perez. So we have uh, a man who spent over, you know, two weeks of time, probably a half a million dollars, to rescue the Anton Refugee mosaics. So it was um, considered at the time that if they found anything in the building that was in the spirit of Lapidus, would they please keep it? And they did save that part. So we feel we have saved part of the interior. Part of Lapidus has been saved. It's in Tallahassee, and those mosaics hopefully will be restored, and they will also be a beacon to other visitors. For 30 years, they were, they were there for everyone, and one day again, they'll be presented. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, thank you all again. We'll see you on this on Monday, and then the next one for this will be on the 7th of October. So have a great night. Thank